Right, uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter, and I'm the chair of Cork Astronomy Club, and you're all very welcome here. I see one or two new faces, you're especially welcome. So, uh, I now have great pleasure in asking uh, Dr. Josh Reynolds to come to the uh, podium. Uh, Josh is, um, uh, he, he's a lecturer at uh, MTU, uh, in the physical sciences department, and uh, he spent a certain amount of time in the Arizona desert at a facility called Veritas, which he will tell you about. And uh, there he conducts gamma ray astronomy. If you're not quite sure what gamma ray astronomy is, be patient, you will soon find out. Josh. Okay, I am a quick thanks to Peter for inviting me along. Um, I was here 10 years ago, and um, a few things have moved on since then. Um, well, I gave a talk on a little bit on Veritas, but hopefully there'll be a new aspect of things that I'll refer to um, tonight. Now, the first thing I have to do is I have to reveal my T-shirt. This has been sitting in my wardrobe, Whipple Observatory, that's where Veritas is located. I've never had a proper opportunity to, to bring it out, so it's on show, and I'm no longer matching with people, so that's good. So give it a That'll work out. Okay, so our business is tonight is we're going to talk about a recent trip um, I paid to Veritas and um, that was the first two weeks of September. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about myself first. So as Peter mentioned, um, I'm a lecturer in the physical science department at MTU. Um, so I teach kind of all over the place in terms of um, topics. Um, I teach a little bit in the physical sciences. They were short on physics hours about 10 years ago. So I was sent out to computing and I've stayed in computing half my time. So in physical sciences, I'm involved in modeling simulation within the computing, computer networking, cybersecurity, internet and network services. That would be my thing. And John from that best part. I tortured him for a year and Cisco. So, but he survived, he survived there, which was good. Now my background, part of that was, was a lecture in the Institute of Technology in Tala for six years. I was a postdoctoral fellow in Iowa State University between 1990 and 92, um, PhD in astrophysics, UCD, and then postgraduate um, Smithsonian Institution. So my history with this project or the progenitors goes quite a bit back in time. So here I've got my history listed out. Um, Veritas came to, into existence in 2003, but I was also involved with the progenitor, which is the Whipple Observatory Collaboration. So that kicked off. Um, 1986, 36 years ago, scary. It's a scary length of time. Um, so my current responsibilities in the collaboration, the Veritas collaboration, is that I'm responsible for atmospheric monitoring on site. So we have, MTU has funded a number of devices. One is a LIDAR, the other is infrared radiometers. So I have to make regular visits out there to calibrate them, rebuild acquisition systems and such the like. And then I'm also involved in routine data analysis data acquisition, that'll be on-site taking data, and I'm currently serving on the Veritas Science Board. So that's a, a cyclical sort of task that comes up every two or three years. Now, what I decided to do tonight is, in the talk, we'll look at four different areas. Um, I want to put these into context first. We mentioned a bit about very high energy gamma ray astronomy, um, and then we'll talk about the science, a small bit about the science. I could devote the entire time, the hour to science, but we'll spend five minutes talking about the science that can be achieved with very high energy gamma ray astronomy. I'll then talk you through Veritas. So I have a, a nice connection of slides there describing. I want to try and put you there, give you an idea of what the place is like and what it's like to work in that environment. And then some details associated with my recent tour of duty up in the high desert where Veritas is located. Now, the first thing is very high energy gamma ray astronomy. And we're talking extreme energies. So we're all familiar with the likes of visible light, we have X-rays, gamma rays. This is up by a number of orders of magnitude. And the reason that we chase down these sort of gamma rays is due to a guy called Victor Hess back in 1912. And he discovered um, cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays are extremely energetic particles. They're coming from all over the universe. Um, and what was noticed on the Earth's, you know, on the surface of the Earth, that charge tends to leak from charged objects. So this character here popped up into a balloon, and he brought some electroscopes with him up to very high elevations. So in a balloon, he went up to 15 to 16,000 feet. 
So quite a brave character. And he discovered that initially, as he moved from the surface of the earth, the rate of discharge decreased, but then it very rapidly increased. So he just knew there was something coming in from outside. So the charged particles coming in from outside that were causing the um, electroscopes to discharge at a higher rate. Now, these are a real thing, these cosmic rays. As I'm standing here, I have about um, one muon per centimeter square per second passing through at this moment in time. And they arise from muons that are generated due to interactions up in the, high in the atmosphere. And they're a real problem, these muons, because they're charged muons, they can cause damage. And the sort of damage they would cause would be for your computer program to crash, or there could be issues associated with um, the electronics in the car. They're charged particles, quite energetic. They can upset electronics. Um, and that's why anybody that's in the IT business will realize that your servers, they have to have special types of memory to deal with the presence of these charged particles. So anybody know ECC? Have you come across that? It's error correcting code memory. You pay a bit more for it. You'll never put it in your own laptop because um, you're never doing anything that terribly critical in a laptop. But all servers use this error correcting code RAM to kind of get them away from problems associated with these charged and new ones coming through the atmosphere. Now we talk about the power associated with these particles. There was a particle discovered back in 1981 in Utah, and it's got its own name. It came in once, it was called the Oh My God particle. And this particle had 30 or 40 joules of energy. So in a single proton, there was a mechanism out there in the universe that could accelerate that particle to an energy equivalent to the power of a second surface in a tennis match, and a good tennis player, not, not a rubbish tennis player. So you're talking 40 joules, single particle, and that's the big question. Where are these things coming from? How are they being accelerated? Now, we want to know where these cosmic rays come from, and we're in trouble straight away, because the cosmic rays are charged, and as they come from outer or from the universe, they hit these magnetic fields, charged particles, get bent and twist all over the place. So if we're viewing from Earth, we will see them coming isotropically from all directions. So we can't really figure out where they come from. We need another tail. And the tail we have is through the use of uncharged particles. So the player that I'm talking about here are the gamma rays. These are photons of energy. There's no charge. They will come directly from our source of cosmic rays. Um, the other player out there is a more a newer sort of player. It's called neutrino. So both of these guys here will be the tail. And we're going to form um, astronomy looking for where the gamma rays come from. If we can see where the gamma rays come from, at least we'll know where these cosmic charged cosmic rays are being generated. Now you're all very familiar with the Earth and or the atmosphere in terms of how well it works. So this is us down here with our optical telescope, pretty good. And um, not too much the line of absorption, but in the gamma ray region, it's a real problem because it's like a brick wall. Effectively, the depth of the atmosphere is the equivalent of a meter of lead. So if a gamma ray hits the top of the atmosphere, there is virtually no chance it's ever going to make it down to the ground level. So we have to get around that problem. And the way we get around that problem is you have to try and escape above the atmosphere to detect the gamma rays. And we'll see in a few minutes that there are a couple of issues associated with that. Now, while I've got the picture here, and um, you can see that as we move to longer wavelengths, here's the infrared, there's a couple of holes that we can actually make measurements in the infrared, but it locks, and there's the radio. So the radio works great. We can run our radio telescopes all day and all night. There is next to no absorption, um, but the really long wave wavelengths get blocked again. So this is our area of interest. We're trying to get at the gamma rays in some fashion without having to rely on our satellites. Now, what I have here is a picture of the latest satellite. It was launched in 2008. It's still going strong. It was the Fermi satellite. And on board, we have the LAT. It's the Large Area Telescope. Um, but large is a part of the thing. It's only a meter square. So this is the detecting area. It might, it might be big compared to the likes of CCD. But in terms of the fluxes, it's really quite small. And of course, you can imagine that the limitations on getting a big detector up there are weight. So here, this is what it's made up of. You have conversion foils, so you have lead and all sorts of metal conversion foils. 
to turn this gamma ray into particles that we can detect, but it's got a tiny area. So there's very limited use in terms of the, the satellites as far as the bigger energies are concerned. It's fine for smaller energies. Now, as luck would have it, there was an option two. And the option two is to use the atmosphere. So rather than having a satellite up there above the atmosphere, you can actually exploit the atmosphere. And the way it works is here's our gamma ray. It interacts at the very top of the atmosphere and you've got a massive cascade, cascade of particles. So it's called an extensive air shower. And these air showers, they look a little bit like this and they make their way down towards the surface of the earth. Now, for the most part, they can fizzle out. They never, these particles do not hit the earth. So maybe up about um, six, 7,000 or probably 15 or 16,000 feet, the particles kind of um, disappear. So that's not great. You can't detect the particles, but you can detect the associated terrain of light. So the point I'm making is that when these particles come in extremely fast, they move through the atmosphere. And when a particle goes faster than the speed of light in a particular medium, it will generate this bluish light, which you see in some, the likes of nuclear reactors. So in this nuclear reactor, we have coolant, we have particles pumping out from the core. Those particles are moving, they're very energetic. They generate that blue light and pray the light makes it to the ground level. So this is our business. That's where the particle interacted right at the top of the atmosphere. It could be up at 12, 13 kilometers. You get this massive shower of particles. Each particle will have a little bit of blue light shrink of light coming off it. It makes it down to the bottom and we're sitting down there with our bowl. Now, in terms of detection area, if you remember, it was one meter squared for the satellite, which costs a bomb to get up there. Here, we have 500,000 meters squared. So an enormous detection area. This here is about 120 meters in diameter, this circular pattern. So about 240 across. If you do the sums, you will see that you've got a really powerful detector. Now, you've got a few problems. Anybody reckon what the problem is here in terms of using the atmosphere? Which we all know about the atmosphere in Ireland, don't we? This will not only work in clear skies. If you cloud up there, it's going to gobble up the light, you're going nowhere. So we need clear skies. We need to make sure there's not too much dust. And we also need to make sure that the moon isn't too bright. So if we've got a full moon, there's a tremendous amount of light in the background and the terrestrial flashes will be buried in that background um, light from the moon. Now, in terms of the brightness of the flash, um, if our eyes integrate it over about 15 nanoseconds, it will be as bright as the full moon. So it's a really fast, really bright flash, but it's only over a very short time period. So that's why when us humans look up, we those flashes are hidden by the starlight and such like, because we integrate over milliseconds. But if you're integrating over a much shorter time, you could actually see that extreme flash. Now we've got flashes. So we here are our two players. This is the good guys. We're mad keen to find out about the gamma rays. We're not so keen about these background. And the background of the charged particles, they're a mess. They cause us issues and they're way more numerous than the gamma rays. So there's for each gamma ray, we probably have a thousand background. So we have to try and figure out how are we going to change or detect the difference between the flashes associated with the gamma rays and the nucleons. And this is how we do it. We actually take a picture. So we've got a camera. Now the camera is very crude by today by the likes of optical camera standards. It, yeah, imagine being able to dial up a shutter speed of 10 nanoseconds. That's what this guy does. It takes extremely fast pictures. So what you can do with this setup is if you point the camera up at the sky, you can take pictures of the flashes and typical gamma ray will be a nice comet shaped pointing towards the part of the sky it came from. Very little ancillary light elsewhere. Here is the big messy cosmic ray shower. It's all over the place. So that's the way that VHE gamma ray works, uh, astronomy works. We take pictures of these flashes and by distinguishing between the big splodgy nucleon background and the nice compact gamma ray, we can actually detect gamma rays from the comfort of Earth. We don't have to send up satellites in space. Now, here is the detector that actually made this major discovery. Um, and it's the Whipple Observatory 10 meter reflector. Um, there was a picture taken in 2006, and I got a picture of my six year old daughter for scale purposes. That's Orla. She was out visiting me on one occasion. 
Um, so it's a big setup. It's quite a big mirror. All the electronics are in this region. And it was based in on top of Whipple Observatory or on top of um, Mount Hopkins in Whipple Observatory. I'll show you some pictures of its location a little bit later on. So at the focus box, this was the original camera. It was 37 pixels. And I actually have one of them. I robbed this. I shouldn't have, but maybe. So there we go. We've got an original pixel. So you can see it's quite a crude device. This is a single pixel that was used inside the 37 camera. This guy here ran at about 400 hertz, 400 pictures per second. And with software, you could detect the difference between the gamma ray background and the hadronic or the nucleons, which were nuisance, or, or the, the noise on the system. Now, um, here was the breakthrough paper. So it was published as a week set out in Astrophysical Journal. And this was the detection of this technique. So it didn't exist prior to this paper. Um, highlighted in red, I have the nice Irish, the Irish people on board. So you can see that we almost made a 50% population on, of the authors. And um, myself there, um, Dave Fegan, he was my boss. This was GC Weeks, he was the, the project leader. He's, he's regarded as the, the top guy in the area. We made this detection um, and it was on the Crab Nebula. So I have a picture of the Crab Nebula, that's in Taurus. Um, now there's been a lot of argument that really the Crab Nebula was discovered by the, well, the Earl of Ross kind of caught it on his big telescope and it looked a bit like a crab and that's how they coined it. But there's a, an argument out there that really we should call it the Irish Nebula. It belongs, I think it does. So what do you think folks? It's good me. And what's even more interesting is wide right in this region, that's about, is that Thurlis? No, it wouldn't be Thurlis, probably. Um, Nina, there's the crab pulsar. So the pulsar is doing his thing. 30, so every 33 milliseconds, you have a rotating neutron star. That's providing the energy inside this pulsar when nebula to generate the gamma rays. Now, this guy is our calibration source. It is rock steady. So we make, a, even in modern, but this is, 30 years further down the line, more than 30 years, we still make measurements on the Crab Nebula because we can trust it. This is how we calibrate our instrument. Now, soon afterwards, um, we made an additional um, discovery. So up to now, this was the only known source of gamma rays in the universe, the UHE gamma rays. A little bit later on, Mark came in 21. This was an extra galactic source. So well, the same group, uh, Michael Punch, the guy I worked with, I worked with them. We've got the same sort of population of Irish people. So this really is an Irish astronomer. I push hard as an Irish astronomer. Um, a lot of people involved. So this UCD group um, that were involved with the Smithsonian Institution, they actually developed the technique over, it was a long, hard road to get the original detection. But this is, this put it on the map. The fact we now have two sources. Um, and of course, you're never content with um, the existing setup. Stereo works so much better. So here we've got four separate detectors. They all take a picture of the same flash. And then if you intersect the major axes, that's where the source comes from. And the, as far as the resolution is concerned, it'd be pretty crummy by optical standards with five minutes of arc. That's what you can detect the source of gamma rays um, to that sort of resolution if you're dealing with a very strong signal. Now the players out there, um, there are four players and um, three of them are quite similar. This is the one I'll be talking about in Veritas. It's located in Arizona. We have HES, which is down in Namibia. And this is a European organization. Here we've got MAGIC, which is based on the Canary Islands. And then we have another type of detector, which uses water churning off. So it doesn't use atmospheric churning off. And this is up at like, it's 4,000 meters. If all of these little containers full of water, they can actually detect the particles geographical spread and so for example if magic happens to see something they communicate to us we're a number of hours pretty much seven hours behind them and down here you pass this will view the southern skies so it's a better view of our you know the, the milky way and um, galactic center so those are the four players and you'll notice for the optical ones stereo views everywhere so this one here and um, this is an enormous 40 meter diameter and these guys here are 12 meters, so we've got five in total. These ones here are 18 meters. And in Veritas, I'll be talking about later on, they're all 12, minute, 12 meter detectors. Um, and you know, it's a happy group. We do a lot of collaboration in terms of our discoveries and keeping on top of things. 
Now, there's a new game in town, and the new game is called CTA, Cherenko Telescope Array. And this is having some birth pangs at the moment. Um, COVID kind of knocked it for six funding. They're developing new telescopes. But this is the way of the future. There will be two installations. You will have CTA North, based in the Canaries, and CTA South, down in the Panama. And these two will be monster observatories. And um, they've got a lot of funding. And um, in terms of the project, you're talking about 1,500 scientists. Um, you're talking about probably about 280 different institutions and 25 countries. The, this will be big when it comes to pass. But luckily for us, they're a little bit slow at getting things underway. So the traditional observatories still have a job to do. So we're still getting funding to run these less sensitive detectors. But in time, when these two guys come on stream, they're going to blow. So it certainly blows away in terms of their sensitivities. Now, what they're going to look like is, I know there'll be 100 telescopes here. I'm not talking four, five, six, 100. Here is what the northern ones will look like. They will come in a monsters, 23 meter. You then have the middle size, 12 to 14. And then you'll, down here, you have the top four meter ones. And down in the southern hemisphere, um, they have more, because there's more to see down in the closer to galactic plane. Um, so this is the layout. We have the, the giant ones, which go for the low energies. The middle ones go for the standard. And these ones go for the high energies. And you do a nice pick and mix. And when this guy comes to play, it will be incredibly impressive in terms of the amount of science it can do. OK, so that's a little bit about the um, gamma ray astronomy. Now we're going to talk a small bit about the science. Now I'm going to keep this quite brief because time is a bit short. But the science, the real motivator behind the science is that we've got a laboratory for particle physics. And now you, I'm sure you've all heard of the Large Hadron Collider that's based at CERN. That's a big money experiment. They pump hundreds of millions of euro into it. And its current um, state of play at the moment is that it can get a collision of 13.6 TeV. That's by 10 to the 12 electron volts. So if you think that a single photon of optical light is about 1 EV, you're talking a lot of energy here. So massive technology required to be able to get that energy in the one place in a collision. The particle I mentioned earlier, the oh my god particle, that is 3 by 10 to the power of 20. So it's 10 million times higher. Nature is the laboratory. In nature, we have acceleration processes taking place that can beat the pants off and CERN. So this is CERN and as good as it gets. So this is what we want to do. We want to use these sources, these galactic and extra galactic sources to probe the particle physics at these extreme energies. Now, in order to do that, it's, it's gotta be a team game. And we could look at the HE gamma ray astronomy, we could learn a little bit about it, but what you need to do is to do simultaneous coverage across the full gamut of spectra. So every once in a while, we will have a campaign looking at a particular object and will be um, observed in all of these areas. So we'll try and coordinate observations along the full range of spectra. And from that, you can do your practical physics. You can theorize what's happening inside these um, sources that are producing enormous, enormously powerful power. So coordinated campaigns is the name of the game. Now here is the source catalog. I took this a couple of days back. Um, when I started, this was empty. So back in 1986, there's nothing there. Um, 1989, there was one object. Then 1992, there was two. We're up at 252 sources. And there's a whole range of different classes of sources out there. Now the ones we, we discussed for are discovered first. And the crab, it's also in nebula, but they come in different flavors. Um, you can have TV halos, um, you know, all sorts of different types of pulsar related sources. We have starburst galaxies. These will be the Alax. Um, so the blazars, they come in different flavors, globular clusters. You have this shell type supernova remnant. And of course, you have to build in there with the gamma ray bursts. So we'll talk a little bit about gamma ray bursts uh, later on. But you can see that it's quite a busy sky. Now, here we're looking at galactic coordinates. As you'd expect, there's going to be a major um, glut of sources in this region, and loads of them are gray. Why do you reckon? See, there's a lot of gray along the galactic center or the galactic plane. Why can't we make any sense of those? Not of dust that's present. 
So we can't look at them, we can't coordinate our viewing with optical due to the amount of dust. So there are gamma rays being pumped out from a number of these sources, but the fact that um, the dust will absorb the optical, the radium, and so on, they, they are classified as unknown. But it's a busy, it's a busy sky, and you'll notice that is the, the big pair of lots of red in this region. This is away from the galactic plane. They're coming from all over the universe. So it's the, the blazars are the big players out there. And those guys produce frightening amounts of energy. If you think about the distance to some of these blazars, and um, if you were to calculate the amount of energy, if we'd won nearby, we'd be curtains. Um, I think it, it would have it would never have been light on Earth due to the power associated. Now, something I will mention a bit later on, um, these guys here are also incredibly unpredictable. And we could, the crab we mentioned is steady, as rock steady in terms of the output. These guys here, one minute can be asleep, and next minute you can have the equivalent of four or five crab, and then half an hour later it's going to sleep again. So great excitement associated with these sources, trying to figure out what the heck is going on in turn. So these are the projects we talked about. And um, the flavors, the blazars, they're the most energetic ones. We mentioned unidentified. The dark matter, um, you look at globular clusters looking for evidence of dark matter. The impulsive wind nebulae and um, supernova remnants, they have a, they, those would be galactic style. And the gamma ray bursts are the guys that, you know, they come from all over the universe. And these produce extreme energies over a really short period of time. So the gamma ray bursts, and um, they were first detected by military satellites. So the US were a bit paranoid about Russia back in the 60s and 70s. They deployed a constellation of satellites called the Vela cluster, and um, Vela satellites, and they detected all of these gamma rays, which normally come from exploding nuclear bombs. And when they triangulated, they saw they were coming from the universe. So these guys have been known about a long time. Now, the US military didn't declassify them um, until reasonably, we probably 20, 25 years ago. But these are the most exciting guys of the lot, these bursts. Because the way the bursts work is they're detected first by satellite. And when we're on duty at Veritas, we have an alarm go off. We have a hawking sound saying, get on the source. And then there's a rush to get to that piece of sky to see if we can see it at the very high energy range. So they're probably the most exciting of all the, the sources. Now, I mentioned that um, in order to learn, you cannot just look at one wavelength. So we have all of these players out there, a whole range of satellites um, in action. So there's um, Fermi. So Fermi is here. Yeah, here we've got Swift. So this guy is the best detector of the gamma ray bursts. We have a live feed from Swift at the observatory. And whenever it detects a gamma ray burst, as I say, it's all um, all systems go, we try and slew our telescope on site as quickly as possible. And the guy who runs it has a present um, at the end of the year, whoever gets there first will get a bottle of wine. There's this really fancy California wine as the prize for the team that actually makes it the biggest. Now we haven't managed to get there on time to actually detect gamma rays, but it's working progress. We're gonna we'll get there at some stage. Now other players that are out there, and um, we have Ice Cube. So that's down at the South Pole. That is looking for neutrinos. We have LIGO Virgos. These are the gamma ray, and they detect uh, gravitational waves. We mentioned HES before. We have Lasso in China. So that's only recently come online. This is up at an enormous height. And um, then we have any other yeah, Chime. This is Canadian and um, set up that's looking for presence of hydrogen. And of course, as I mentioned already, you have all of these satellites. So it's one big network constantly looking for at different sources, trying to figure out what the, what the deal is. Okay, so that's our science taken care of. And we're going to move on now and talk a bit about Veritas. And Veritas came to light, was inaugurated in 2007, um, and I have 2025 plus. We recently received funding to keep us going for another three years. And if the delays in that big CTA probably worked out for a benefit. So this is a snapshot of Veritas. Um, what we have is we have four of these 12 meter reflectors and they work in stereoscopic mode. 
about 30 kilometers from Mexico, and you'll see it's in the high desert. So a lot of scrub land around here, and um, so that is where the whole thing is located. We have our central building. I have more pictures that will deal with this. There's, there's the control building in there. And then yeah, associated with each of the detectors will be a separate cabin where the electronics are, are located. Now, as far as the geographic location is concerned, um, here I zoom in at this time. So we off into the US, into Arizona, and there is our Mexican border. And that's what's located. It's right on the outskirts of Coronado National Forest. So it's at a height, it's the high desert, about 4,000 feet. That's where it's located. And it's about a 30 to 40 kilometer trip to the border. Um, now, there are issues. Anybody guess the issues? Being so close to the border. You find that there's a lot um, of people trying to sneak their way into the US over the, you know, they put, put some fencing there, but they're trying to sneak their way across. And coupled with that, the coupled with that will be border patrol. So, in some respects, I think it must be a little bit like. And what it would be in the Vietnam War. We have helicopters coming through with headlights, really strong lights. So we'd be very conscious of the presence of those aircraft because they could destroy our, our experiment very, very quickly. So its location, there's the big city, Tucson, that's nearby. So this is about an hour's drive down to here. You have um, another city here called Green Valley, and that's a retirement community. And when I went there first, I was 22 years of age. Um, and there's a rule that you must be at least 55 to live. And I would look, look at all those old people. I'm not one of those old people. Well, what can you do? I used to always think that everybody moved very slowly around the, the shopping centers. You get stuck in a traffic jam, trying to buy some food to make the observatory. Um, but I'm probably part of the traffic jam now. But it, it was interesting. So this is where the, the experiment is located. Um, it's a big enough collaboration. Now, in terms of um, manpower, we probably get a lot, a lot of bang for our book. We've got 100 members in total, and you can see these are the countries that are involved. I put a nice flag and to represent each one of them. Um, it's alphabetic. So in Canada, McGill, we have quite a few guys working from McGill. That's up in Montreal. And Germany, we have Daisy. That's in, in Zeuthen, just outside Berlin. Then we have Ireland. So there's three different groups involved. So MTU, that's myself. NUI Galway, with Gary Galanders, Mark Lang based there, and some students. And University College Dublin, John Quinn is the, the, the guy in charge. Now, John, uh, I should mention him here. John is the Vertas Post person. So he is number, numero uno in the collaboration. He speaks to the collaboration and um, had his first tour of duty. It was our term of duty, which is two years. He's been reelected. So he's another year to, to spend. So he's a busy guy trying to keep all of these, the glue, to keep all of this together. Now, on the American side, you'll see that there's quite a range of different organizations, you'll, remember, you'll probably recognize some of them, UCLA, um, we have University of Chicago, that will be a major player too. So a lot of these will be top like universities and some very, very clever people um, that play a role in the um, organization. Now the nine founding institutions of 15 collaborating, so it's of the order of 100 people involved, which by comparison with some of the other groups, it is probably a little bit on, this, on the small side as far as manpower. So we really have to work hard to be able to get the data and, and to get the instrument maintained. Now, we all went through the COVID stuff and they actually had their first meeting together in um, Daisy and Zeuthen this summer. So we've got a, a good chunk of people and then loads, where am I? That's me, yeah. I, I had a COVID issue at the time, so that was me grounded, unfortunately. Um, but at, at least things are starting to come together. And the funding, um, the big player is NSA, our NSA. National Science Foundation has kind of provided enormous funds to keep this up and running. So the running costs um, will be, you know, all, of the order of maybe half to three quarter million dollars a year. It is expensive to keep it going. Um, Canada provides some information, Helmholtz in Germany. And we did quite well at the Science Foundation in Ireland up to about 2012. But when the, the crunch came, they stopped the funding basic research. So we've been kind of surviving on scraps with our own home institution and some funding from the US. But the National Science Foundation is the organization that keeps things going. Now, this is a detail of where, where we are, the elevation about 4,000 feet. And we have our 12 meter optical reflectors. And now it's a, as far as our output, scientific output, it's, it's pretty damn good. So we've hit the science journals. I will 
I'll show you some of the publications later on. Science would be well up there, and Nature is probably one of the top um, uh, journals out there. So we had a number of publications in Nature and Nature Astronomy. Now here are a list of the ones that were worth mentioning. And this has degrees to star formation in the M82 galaxy, Starbucks galaxy. And um, this one was a really technical one. We actually detected the pulsar in the Crab Nebula. So in the Crab Nebula, you have a lot of its pulsar wind source, but a very small fraction of the signal would be coming from the pulsar itself. So that was the deal, was to actually extract. So the noise there were gamma rays from the, the nebula. And with very careful measurements, we could actually see. Now that upset a lot of theoreticians. They said that this should not exist. So that was a, a real piece of kudos for the collaboration to actually detect these gamma rays and then to go back to the drawing boards and try and figure out um, the, the various acceleration mechanisms in place. Now another player, would this would be um, a multi-messenger. So the ice cube spotted something and then with another 10 groups, we actually discovered um, a flaring blazar that was producing these neutrinos. So this was great excitement associated with that. And the last two here, um, we're dealing with something slightly different. We're actually moving into optical astronomy because Veritas can only run three weeks every month. So it has a, a week of downtime due to the presence of the moon. So some of the really bright sparks on board in the collaboration actually found a way to use that week of downtime. And it's all associated with getting stellar diameters. So making very careful measurements of stellar angular diameters through two separate techniques. So, okay, there's the output, the gamma ray pulse we mentioned that before. There was the neutrinos and gamma rays coming from one source. This one here, you might, might take in your fancy. It was a new technique and we actually used, so there's the star in the distance. We used um, one of these asteroids. An asteroid passes in front of the star and we can measure the time associated with the intensity of this occultation. Now, if you're dealing with a point source, you can actually predict what this guy looks like, but the fact that it's a star doesn't, isn't actually a point source. It has a finite diameter. So you could measure the thickness of the star or its stellar diameter through the shape of both the ingress and the egress patterns. So this purely coincident, well, every once in a while, you can predict when these asteroids will do their thing and using your four um, 12 meter diameter telescopes, you could do some optical astronomy quite effectively. Now here's the second player that this is still live. This will be coming back um, at work again at the end of the month. And um, it uses um, interferometry, stellar interferometry. So you've got these massive telescopes again, 12 millimeter diameters, and they're pretty much immune to scintillation in the atmosphere. And that allows you to um, do real-time correlations between the photon signals between each of the pairs, and that will give you very accurate um, measurement of stellar diameters. So we've gone into the mainstream. So I think I was really impressed that we can actually use this facility, kind of um, 20, from the, not quite 24, um, for the full month, three weeks out of the month, doing gamma ray astronomy, and then the final week, doing some very careful um, optical astronomy. Now, um, in terms of what Veritas looks like, um, I mentioned before, it's 12 meter diameter, and um, you've got all these facets, 350 facets, and it's a harsh environment because you're dealing in an environment where you've got a lot of sand and dust. And as you know, from your optical telescopes, you have to take care of those mirrors. These guys have no cover on them. So we need to recoat them every two years, and we have an on-site recoating facility. And um, so in terms of how the recoating takes place, we deposit a layer of aluminium and then we anodize it. And the anodization has to be half the wavelength of um, blue light. So we get constructive interference from it. So the anodization makes sure that these will survive two to three years. Without the anodization, they'd be worn in three or four months. So this, that's a process we developed um, and we use it. There's a guy whose sole job is keeping these telescopes nice, reflectors nice and shiny. Now here's our teller, here's the detector. And as I mentioned before, you're not talking about a lot of pixels, 500 pixels. In terms of their width, they're about 0.1 each PMT is about 0.15 degrees. So it's enormously bigger than your, your camera and pixel size. 
But where they win is they're extremely fast. So they'll kind of detect 10 nanosecond signals. And photomultiplier tubes, some people scoff, they say they're old technology, but they're perfect for this application. Um, new technologies would use silicon photomultiplier tubes, which are much smaller in size. But this was developed back for the, um, in excess of 15 years ago. Um, we swapped in new, a new camera. It's still working very, very effectively. Now, I had to take a couple of pictures. Um, this is while I was out there in September. Um, I brought my old camera, taking a nice um, 30 second exposure, and up rocks from the technicians in his car, headlights on. Magic. Purely by chance, it illuminated the bottom of the structure. As I say, the normal would look like this in darkness. So here we can see our 12 meter detector. There's the focal point, And you can see that you get some extremely good skies of the order of about 300 odd days a year. So it's a superb place for performing astronomy. So that was a, a lucky break on my part um, in terms of that, that picture. Here we have a picture, another picture of it with no um, back illumination. <laughs> But you can actually see we're slowing down. So there's a, a little bit of motion visible on the, on the device. Now, I've spent all night, every night, um, out taking these time lapse photographs, but I, am, I had to do some work as well. So I could only do a little before I had to get back to work. Now, it's detection capabilities. Um, uh, we mentioned angular resolution is about five minutes of arc. So, if I'm, you know, in terms of optical, that's terrible. And what do you get in Cork? About a couple of seconds of arc. Would that be fair enough, folks? Would that be your typical full, full width half max? Probably of that order. So we're up by a factor of 60, more than 60, but a factor of 300 than an optical. But it's fine for our application. So in the one field of view, we could actually see multiple sources, um, uh, WPOMI and one yes, 1280. And so we could capture those simultaneously in our field of view. At the facility, um, I have a range of pictures here. I took this one when I was out in September. And um, so we can see, you get some phenomenal sunsets. It's not going to be great for observing, but at least the, the colors look good. And um, so in the distance, that's the Baba Kavri Peak. So this is on the Indian Reservation. And um, it's a technical mountain, so it's ropes needed. And um, one of the guys I work with actually managed to climb it, but I think they've restricted access now. So Mexico down this direction, we can see our four telescopes. And there's quite a bit of growth here. Um, in September, um, due to the fact that the rainy season occurred over the summer. Here we've got a view. Um, so up at the top here, we've got a view of two telescopes coming up the road. And there is the control, or the control building for the telescopes. Um, here is a panorama view. Those icons are wonderful. That's working on telescope T3. So you get a view of what it looks like in the environment. And um, there, that's the administration complex. And up we'll talk about it later on, this is the top of Mount Hopkins. So the MMT is once the largest mirror in the or telescope in the world. That's up on top, as I say, of Mount Hopkins. And this is the Santa Rita mountain range. Um, picture taken by night. Um, so under moonlight, if you look at it a bit closer, you actually see a little bit of streaking of the stars. Once again, not a great night for observing due to Cirrus, by the looks of Cirrus. But you know, apart from that, you can get phenomenal nights. And this is my favorite ever selfie. And um, so you wouldn't believe how the speed I had to make. I was sitting on a tripod and um, I had a, a timer on it and I made it up to the top. Um, nice background, looking good. Here is another telescope that's on site. So while we're talking about the um, facility, this is, remember I mentioned CTA error? They have a, a prototype version. And that is living, there is one of our T2 telescope. This is living on the same site. So this particular telescope is one that we're going to deploy in CTA. It's 12 meters in diameter, and it's an unusual design in that you've got two mirrors, you have a mirror here and a mirror there, large mirrors. So it's done to improve the quality of the images. Um, and Chi, can you make them? There's Chi, he's hard at work there, um, working on the um, actuators on the mirrors. So each mirror, subsection mirror is an actuator for pointing purposes. So this is going from strength to strength. They ran it the year before last and they managed to detect um, the Crab Nebula. So this is the type that will probably be used in CTA further down the line. Now I'm gonna hop into the control room. Um, any programmers? Does this make a programmer? This is the logical and. So some bright spark said food and drink are these both. So if I put in the logical R, it's a geeky thing, forgive me. Um, so that was put up there. Here we've got myself at work. And there's Taka, Taka's from Japan. 
We were hard at work, typically of two people uh, um, at the controls at all time, with a third person um, just scurrying around doing routine jobs in the background. So we're, we've got all the displays in use here. So you can see that there's quite a good graphical user interface with the telescope. Um, now, part of the deal, of course, is the only the young astronomers, they hate going outside. Now, it could be fear of the tarantulas or the snakes. Um, I'm, we're not quite sure, but um, one of the, my colleagues, he reckoned that we really should um, have some sort of control on the number of times we actually go out to view the telescopes. Because even though with all these sensors, you won't be able to smell burning, you won't be able to hear motors grinding or anything like that. So he had the, the, the great suggestion that we really should put a little point box scope running. You have to put in a euro every couple of hours. That would get them out and get them looking around. So all the young guys that stay in the heat, they hate to, I spent half my night out walking, but all possible. Um, so they upgraded the control room. So this was taken about two weeks ago. We got these beautiful stretchy screens and um, a little bit more information present. Here we've got our radio systems. And um, I just noticed just a little bit before this evening, I had actually all the passwords um, on the board here. So I managed to prop it together the passwords, uh, passwords for the site. That was worthwhile. And inside here, we've got the L2 room. So that's where all our electronics will live for the triggering. So this receives signals from the four telescopes, processes it, and saves the information. Now, kit peakers, um, you're all, if you're optical, you've heard of kit peak. There it is across the valley. So I reckon that's about 40 kilometers away. Um, so that's, I think that's the McMath Solar Telescope, it's the one that's obvious. So they don't look particularly clear at the moment. This was an early morning shot. So that will be part of the surroundings. Here we've got Mount Hopkins, the multi mount commercial, we'll refer to the MMT, but I'm not sure what it stands for now. They just have a single reflector. But in the past, there was five separate mirrors on this and um, that worked in unison to give a um, very high quality response. Now, here is a map of where Veritas is located. So we're just outside Coronado National Forest, and I mentioned we're up about 4,000 feet. Here is the dormitory. So you can opt to sleep in the dormitory if you like. And at certain times here, it's great. And um, I'll show you a picture of the dormitory. I think there's 12 rooms. We have an amazing pool table with the lean on one corner so you can take out any visitors who don't know about it. Um, lovely cooking facilities. Here we've got the ridge, a number of telescopes, and there's the MMT right at the top of at 8,600 feet. Now you might guess from looking at the coat, the contours of the road, you're talking a steep road here. And the road is a dirt track. So you have to be mighty careful in certain times of the year. So September is a risky enough time of the year because you can have the remnants of the monsoon storms. They can wash out the road and make it very slippy. So I went out on my two week visit. I stayed up this direction here in an accommodation in that retirement, the retirement community. Um, but on different times there, I'd actually stay up top. So you'd work all night and then you'd make the trip up to the top and um, blackout lines, all the comforts of home, very, very nice. Oh, here's the top of Mount Hopkins. This is the MMT and probably one of the steepest roads I've ever encountered, all right up on the very top. Um, and you might guess that's going to cause issues in winter. And they actually have, this is a heated road. So they have a giant um, generator that will actually heat this road up. If you buy on it, you can never make it up. And they used to bring cars to test their power up this road. And um, so incredibly steep to get up to the very top. Here is our building and the MMT. And the MMT, I've got a notice on it, probably not that easy to see, but caution to the building. So it is the only known insurance claim in the US for a building hit a car. And so they swiveled around, somebody had parked too close and they, they mangled out of the car. So that, that's quite a while back. So the whole, the telescope is located inside this. It swivels around during the night. And pretty nice piece of engineering. Now, when we're at the very top, we can look across the, this is the ridge. So that's where the old time meeting used to live. They're at the dormitory in that region. Um, and the 10 meter, this is quite an old picture of this one. Um, a, a number of optical telescopes, 60 inch telescope, 24 inch. Um, I think that's a 35 inch. And then from the very top, you can look down and there's Veritas down at the base of the mountain. So we're up, up at the top here, we're up about 8,000 feet. This is down to 4,000. So you can imagine um, it's going to be an interesting drive. There is a ridge dormitory, as I mentioned, it's very um, comfortable. There's a view from um, the entrance into it. 
So you've got our neighboring mountain on Brightson, fabulous hike. Um, nothing better than walk over there for sunrise. And you have to, it's probably about five hour. So that's up at 9,000 feet. You have a road and there's the road downhill. So you should be able to see the zigzags in the road and the switchbacks as they make their way down. Now, one of those um, canyons is called Toyota Canyon. Can you guess why? I'm sure you can. So somebody drove the Toyota over the edge and they survived. But the Toyota was down there for a while and they managed to scrape it out. Um, look, it looks pretty good at the moment. So it's, it's, there's a tarmac on it to a certain range. And then it goes to rough to keep the, the casual members of the public away from it. And it becomes a little challenging in the winter, as you might imagine. So here we've got, I took this one myself. I just come out of the dormitory. It's not looking good. So I have to make my way down at 24 kilometers. And um, first thing I have to do is try and defrost the car and get the ice off it. And um, one of the trips was down, that was the road. And I got to the bottom and I was extracting my fingernails out of the steering wheel. It's a stressful drive. So the cars are good and they have four wheel drive. You have chains in the boot to help you out. And as I've got older, I've become a wimp. And in terms of staying up high, I've, you know, I mean, if the, web, if the road is going to be good, I'll stay up high, but otherwise I'll, I'll go for the, what I would consider a slightly safer option. Um, so there was my tour of duty. So it was two weeks. And um, for the last three years, we're out of luck because COVID situation, everything was remote. We had a technician, and this is a setup at home communicating the telescope. And um, here we've got a view of Veritas. Veritas is down the bottom here. There's the Mount Hopkins, and there's the other mountain, uh, Mount, Mount Brightson. And the picture, I have to take a picture of Vigo. Here we've eight miles to Veritas. So it's a river. I've only seen water in it once. But there have been cases where this bridge actually washed away due to the monsoons. So monsoons, bad news. Um, August, July, August, incredibly heavy rain in the afternoon. So it's clear in the morning, clouds build up, rain, thunder, lightning, and get into a cycle. So here we've got a view of a typical storm. Now, the only way you can survive lightning is to disconnect everything. So we have to do that at the beginning of June or at the mid end of June, and then reconnect it up afterwards. Now, here we have a view of the monsoon season. Let's see if this guy will play for me. No, no, no volume. All right. um, I have a very excited technician beside me. He got all excited about two rainbows. But the, the rain is spectacular. Um, accompanying that will be these guys. They're everywhere. So this is the Colorado toad, and they're bouncing left, right, and center. They are living in the riverbeds. When they get a bit of water, they have a great time. So in terms of size-wise, it's about the size of your hand, probably a little bit bigger. And the poison glands here, so when pets get them, they can, it can be nasty. Here is a picture of when I stayed. Um, and here is where the observatory was. We actually had extreme case of um, three inches of rain in three hours. And when I went back to my accommodation, there had been serious damage done with hailstones the size of one euro coins that has been destroyed. Um, picture of the monsoon seasons again, amazing sunsets. So what we had to do for the two weeks, while well, we were a bit delayed starting off because the monsoons were still hanging around. Here I'm busy at work connecting up the 500 channels associated with each of the telescopes. You know, we're doing a little bit of work connecting at the telescope side and a couple of my colleagues at work as well. In terms of the MTU system, this is my first two weeks work. Um, MTU purchased this piece of equipment. It's a LiDAR system. It's been running Touchwood since 2011. So I have to make regular visits to it to recalibrate it and rebuild the um, communication systems Get up and running, and that monitors 24 7 monitoring of atmospheric conditions. Another piece of great kit that MTU looks after are these infrared radiometers. So we have one of them on every telescope, and that measures the temperature of the sky. It's superb for detecting the presence of clouds. Now, food plays a major role at the observatory. Um, so here we've got Jack, who's one of the technicians. He is the guru on the barbecue. Um, Steaks and such like. Here we have the crew, and um, this was the rewiring queue crew set up. Um, so Bill, Jack, um, Alicia. So we were dining on um, beautiful, amazing size steaks and corn and such like. And um, every once in a while, as I said, very important the food side of things. And um, so what we do on occasion is we treat ourselves to a trip to the Longhorn Cafe, which is down on Amado. And I couldn't resist the snap coming out of the Longhorn, the lonely, the lonely cowboy. He was just making his way from one of the bars 
So the cow palace is ideal, didn't look the happiest. But these, everybody puts their shoulder to the wheel on these sort of um, set on these sort of um, tours of duty, getting the telescope up and, up and running and getting the, the system active again. Now, you'd be happy to see the summary. Um, we started taking data about three days after I left. Um, still some weather issues. The, the monsoons hung around a bit longer. But 25th of September, all was good. So we're ready for action in dark room number two. So when the moon is gone, 14th of October, we have a functioning system, MAD gets stuck into it. Now in terms of justification on my side, um, the research informs teaching. Because for example, here when we're looking at reconnecting a system, it just isn't just plug in and go away. The lightning causes major damage, even though we've done disconnects. So my background is in networking, my skill set comes in very handy there. We had to debug a lot of networking issues associated with switches low, located in the camera. So it's a major effort getting up and running. But as I say, we're good to go now. And this sort of research informs teaching. So it's great to be able to tell stories to the likes of the students um, about the technical issues and a bit about the astronomy and so on. And it's also a fabulous source of data for um, data analytics students. So I normally have a crop of um, BSc students that do projects on these data every year, and they love working with real data, and they generate some very useful output for the average. Okay, acknowledgements, I've left a blank. Um, my home institution, yeah, they have been very supportive in providing some funding, and Niall Smith can provide some from the research office, and also in the US, there can be a little bit of funding from that direction as well. Things were going great until the major crunch in funding back in 2012. So the, the temptation was to abandon ship and take up something else. But, you know, it's, it's addictive, this whole area of science. So myself and my colleagues in Galway and Dublin, we stuck to it. We get little crumbs of funding from time to time. But we've managed to stay as active members of collaboration. And um, all is good for the future in that point. Okay, he's on his way, so I better stop. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Well, we now come to the question and answer and um, I'll start off with a couple myself. Josh, I was uh, surprised that these modes so far sound. I didn't realize you had that. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, but uh, what, what, what was the temperature like on the morning of September? I mean, you were already in short sleeves. I couldn't scan up your pictures. No, you're up at 4,000 feet, so that kind of cools it down a little bit. Yeah. Um, and of course, you can't go around in flip flops or anything like that because of risks of snakes and good things like that. Um, so I it's have temperature to stand because I have to oh, you have to be visible. <laughs> Um, no, the temperature is never that bad for that height, especially up higher, you know, up at the top of Mount Hopkins now would be very tolerable. But Tucson, we've got 2,000 feet. In the summertime, we get baked. So in, um, I have to convert about 280 or 118 Fahrenheit would be common. So you see people driving around with open gloves on their hands and the steering wheel of the car. So I had a, a case of Coca-Cola that every can, all 12 cans explode in the middle two feet. So severe temperatures in the summertime. But the, the winter is fast. The winter is absolutely fast. So we have a, there's a group of they're called the snowbirds. They come down from the um, colder um, states in the winter, and they kind of occupy southern Arizona. And when it gets hot, they head up north again. So there will be a big transit train migrating to population in that part. Of the country. Now my other question was, I didn't quite gather. Are there some objects which you only know about because they emit gamma rays? I mean, the Crab Nebula. Okay, yeah. We know about that already, no? We do, yes. But I mean, the gamma ray bursts and the lasers, I, I, I didn't quite gather whether these are objects which are already, already known or are only already known. known. Gamma That's, um, I don't know of any object that purely produces VHE gamma rays because you have acceleration mechanisms and to get those acceleration, acceleration mechanisms up and running, you would need. Um, activities at lower um, energies. So you'll see lights of polarized, visible light, radios, and stuff. And now gamma ray bursts, yeah, the therapy, they all have counterparts. Now we have a load of unidentified stuff. So unidentified, they could be anything. Um, but for the most part, they, they will be accompanied by um, signatures at other rates. Now, any other questions to Josh? And uh, John, you may have some of those. One person in the um, asked in Victor Fran states, uh, not to be in literature or in Germany. Yeah. Oh, somebody can be happy on this one. 
And I, I think that you're uh, in your mind. Oh, apologies. I'm not sure. I'd have to check that one out. Uh, I think that's one for Mr. Google. Has anybody got Google Live? All right. No, I can't. So I thought my, my I thought it was German, but perhaps not. So I'm not sure about that. But uh, I'm certainly a very brave man. And the fact going, he used to go up in thunderstorms as well because he thought lightning might have something to do with it. So a balloon at 15,000 feet in a thunderstorm does not sound like um, a very safe place. I help and safe you certainly. And stamp it out these days. John, you have another question from the screen earlier. I don't know what I'm talking about. How do you compensate for sources of gamma radiation which are aligned behind each other, which appear as one source with an increased strength? We can't, we haven't got the web, sorry, we haven't got the resolution. So I mentioned our resolution is about five minutes of arc. Um, so if we can't resolve them, we can't say much about them. So that's an interesting, interesting question. And um, so that probably is, represents a problem at Optigo. But if you look at the distribution or the number of gamma ray sources we have across the sky, there tends to be pretty big gaps between them. So I'm sure at some stage, there will be a case where you'll have cascaded emission coming from two objects. Look, um, I'm not aware of that much. And as I say, our resolution is a limiting factor. Any other questions from the room? Bill. Yeah. Yes, and gamma, gamma ray bursts, that's their thing. So we already have a couple of satellites up there that measure the gamma ray bursts. So this is a new addition. Um, so they, they are incredibly um, exciting. So as you know, our big push is to try and get on source as quickly as possible and see if there's a corresponding high energy burst going with it. Now our competitors, HES, I'm not HES, uh, MAGIC, they have actually seen one of them. So we're, we're a little bit behind on that front. Um, but as I say, you're, you're observing away and next thing the alarm goes off and it's all, it's, it's all hands on deck when you get on board. Oh yeah, it worked with that data. So what you do, what, um, UCD would, exactly, UCD would work with that data. Now the guy who actually runs it is based in California. He's the guy that's in charge of the whole gamma ray burst. So he, you know, but we'd all get a chance to analyze the data. So you come back the following night and just hope for the best. Go on site, make your measurement, and then, you know, measure about an hour. That takes top priority. No matter what you're looking at, you will always swivel to the gamma ray burst and try and measure. So that's the one that we're trying to capture. Okay, no problem. Any other questions? I saw our hand over here from that. No? The rainy season, season you just turn the, the, the off. Absolutely. So in the, the question is in the rainy season, you turn everything off. Yes, we anything with copper in it is looking for trouble. And um, now for, uh, when I used to work up at the very top, I remember sitting down having my lunch with a couple of my compatriots, and there was a lightning strike nearby, and the flame this side jumped out, jumped out of the earth connection in the wall. And the guys looked at it and they just moved the seats a little bit from the room. <laughs> So the whole mountainside used to actually raise up to probably 40 or 50,000 volts. So the way around that was they put in a big flagpole, which actually attracted the lightning. And there was a, a, a cone underneath it that was protected. So one of these giant um, flagpoles, you know, with, now the copper was about this thick and it could take any current. That kind of took away some of the damage. But every September, it's debugging. We've never had a September that you could start up at the appointed date. There's always surprises. And you'd be scratching your head, I had the guys were out with their blueprints trying to figure out why they were getting, and this was at four in the morning. So they were incredibly dedicated a lot. You know, they, the technical support out there and the managers, they, they really throw everything at it. I've been take one more question. Yeah. Oh, John, John you got a question there? Yeah, I would hear it. Yeah. Um, the question basically is, uh, what is the ultimate goal of this research? Well, the, the title then has said it a bit, it's the origin of cosmic rays. That's what we're all chasing after. But some of the big benefits along the way is that we're effectively getting the equivalent of the, the CERN Large Hadron Collider for free. So there are, there's a laboratory out there um, in the universe that is accelerating these particles to a much greater extent than can ever be achieved on Earth. So we're, I would say our first job is to try and figure out the source cosmic rays. 
But the byproduct of that is being able to um, kind of investigate particle physics. And so there's a number of different um, theories out there as to whether it's hadronic or lepto and leptonic um, type of acceleration mechanisms. So the jury is still out there, but we're, we're getting closer to an answer. We'll have to call the whole for the questions then, I'm afraid. So now uh, it comes to my... Uh, thank you, Josh, and I need to... Uh, thank you, I need to be on the screen. Uh, and I have a small gift for you here, of the Cold Astronomy Cup, and you're giving us some fascinating details about your working conditions and the various toads that today sound <laughs> at all. And uh, thank you very much for talking to us about uh, gamma ray astronomy. Thanks, that was great. Very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Thank you.